بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله في نعمه يكافي مزيدا يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي للجلال والشيك والعظيم سلطانه سبحانك لا نحسيتنا أنا عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك فلك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في كل وقت وحين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الملل العلى إلى يوم الدين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد حتى تلك الأرض ومن عليها أنت خير وارثين نويت تعلم التعليم وتذكر التذكير نفع انتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على تمسك بكتاب الله بسنة الرسول صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء الهدى ودلالة على الخير انتظاء وشيلاء ومقراته وخلبه وفوابه سبحانه وتعالى in sha Allah ta'ala in continuation of our look of thematic look at the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama and he arrived at a period, a very important period that when we looked into Mecca, the reality of Mecca we looked at the various stages of da'wat al-Muhammadiyyah of the actual summons or the call of the Prophet himself sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama so we spoke about the actual um, secret stage, the discreet stage of the da'wah I when Islam quote unquote was like a subversive activity, subversive activity inside of Mecca, it's a clandestine nature of Islam inside of early Mecca. Without indeed from the existence and encapsulated inside of the existence of Dar al Qam. And likewise Dar al Sa'id, the two great bastions of early Islamic erudition and learning inside of Mecca to Mukarrama, the house of Sayyidina al Qam ibn al Qam al Makhzumi, the great house of Safa, in which the Prophet had held, held, held counsel and taught. In the reality of faith and other realities. And likewise, also the house of Sayyidina Sa'id ibn Zayd, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Adawi, the great house in which the great Al Khabbab ibn Al Rat, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was liyabat and alayhi rasul, was the representative of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as the teacher of the tradition. And thereafter, we see with the Islam of Sayyidina Umar ibn Al Khattab, when Sayyidina Umar ibn Al Khattab becomes a Muslim, then we see a new phase is ushered in. Inside of the, what the reality of Islam and the da'wah of the Prophet Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab being the 40th Muslim, 40th person to become Muslim. And this is the fifth year after the after prophecy, after the revelation, after the Nubuwa, Sayyidina Umar. And that brings in the, the sort of public stage of the da'wah where people are being called unto Islam. Okay? And thereafter, with the hijrah of the Prophet Sayyidina Umar, to Medina to Munawwara, the establishment of the new um, citadel, bastion of Islam. Then we have a different stage. I as the Imams that they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sends Al Kitab Al Hadi. Allah Ta'ala sends the guiding book, Usaif al Nasir, and he sends also the victorious sword. I the sword comes to preserve and to protect the book, to preserve and to protect the actual word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until it becomes uppermost and uh, kalimat Allah al Ulya. As the Prophet وسلم, and he was asked about the nature of Fisabilillah, what is in the way of God? And he says that one fights and you qatil so that the kalima, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ulya, that is superior, but who are That's somebody in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet وسلم, said. So this is the, the, the medley stage, but the nature of what the actual address, the sword, is protecting the word as it's conveyed still to Arabia. And in particular towards Quraysh as well as Medani society. So it's still somewhat localized, the da'wah. It's still an Arabian phenomenon. I, it's not a world address, a world address. Okay, but we're going to come into now a stage, which is the final stage of the prophetic conveyance, where now the Prophet says, That we've sent you as a mercy to the to the world, the alameen. This world of sentient being, okay, entire worlds, 
And that is not really going to manifest up until what the age in which now we're about to approach, i.e. the sixth year after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, but in order for that really to manifest, that war there has to be a cessation of war between the Prophet ﷺ and the arch enemies who are from his own tribe, Quraysh. There has to be a cessation of war. And that's what's going to culminate now in what's going to be known as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which, which is where we're at. And one of the things that we take from this thematically is the manifestation of the reality of Islam. I, the reality of Islam is about bringing about a state of peace and security. And that's in the very name in and of itself. It's Islam, the ulama. When you ask about Islam, it's East Islam from one perspective because it has a vertical relationship as well as a horizontal relationship. In terms of the vertical relationship, it's about submission to God. And it meant aslama wajhahu lillah wa huwa mu'min. That the one who can submit, yistaslim wajhahu, yani vatahu, his entire being to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa huwa mu'min, whilst in a state of faith. That's a believer. And the objective is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the vertical relationship. But in terms of the horizontal plane, the nature of Islam has two realities. One of them, Islam, they put on al-dadad in the Arabic language, opposites. One of them, Islam, is about removing a state of peace and security, not procuring a state, and it bringing about a state of war and conflict. And that's the nature of what we see up to this point in time, and it's the nature of Deen al Islam. So long as Kalimatullah, so long as the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being conveyed, there will be war, yani mujrimin, there will be those who oppose the word of God. I have to oppose the way the prophets, those great glorified beings. How would you oppose a prophet? When I mean, you gaze at a prophet, you should force, be forced into a state of sujood. How then could you draw the sword or draw the gun to try and take the life of a prophet? There's something gone but wrong inside of the heart of that type of being. But that's just the nature, a conflict, the narrative of the human being of these opposite forces until one force ultimately manifests. Yani, Comes victorious, and that force is always what the force of prophecy, the force of the divine, and that's in the tradition of the Bukhari of saying uh, Abu Sufyan. When Abu Sufyan is asked about the nature of this war, this conflict, okay, between prophecy and between Quraysh, that's what we've seen now. And in Abu Sufyan, there's a harm, baynana wa baynahum sijal. So when it's called sijal, and the war between us and them is sijal. And see, Jal is that it's the narrative of conflict, of war. Uh, okay, when Caesar heard the answer, Caesar then says to what? To Abu Sufyan, that is the nature of prophets, the war of prophecy. I prophets are always opposed, and it's Sijal. And Sijal means one day for them, one day for us. Okay, the conflict what is maintained up until prophecy becomes uppermost. Like prophecy ultimately will vanquish the forces ultimately. Okay, and that's what the nature of prophetic war tells. Ayyamu da wuluha bayn al nas. Allah Taala says that those are the days that we alternate between people. One day it's manifest victory, another day it's tadib. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala disciplining the forces of prophecy, as we saw inside the what the battle of Uhud when we discussed the battle of Uhud. So here, so in one state, from one perspective, Islam always removes states of peace and security. There has to be conflict, nature of the nature of the divine way, especially in the context of Tuhyan, the context of an aberration of human fitrah, and when human beings begin to what stray from Tawheed, from that ultimate is Islam submission to the divine reality. And we see this, that's why the great words that describe this religion and the people adherents of this religion, like the Hanif, the Hunafa, you said the word Hanif means deviance. Those who deviate from a social or a socio-religious norm, that's a hanif. Likewise, adal, somebody who is who adal. Adal, which we know the way for justice. The way adal and justice means deviance. For lughat al-Arab, classical Arab, it means some type of deviancy. Okay, because the nature of people of justice, uh, the nature of people of the hulafa, which is ahl al-istiqamah, the upright ones, they're always ones who deviate from a social religious norm when that social religious norm is taghut, is that which is what oppressive, that which consists or is based upon idolatry. That's where the conflict arises until the forces of prophecy become victorious. And when the forces of prophecy become victorious, now it's the opposite meaning of Islam in the horizontal plane, which is now to bring about a state of peace and security. 
And that's what we see with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will not take flight to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala until Mecca is of the most peaceful places for a Muslim to be. It wasn't only a few years earlier, but he brings about peace, safety and security inside Mecca to Al-Mukarram, inside Medina to Al-Munawar, etc. And again, if you were somebody who would understood Arabian history prior to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that was something unimaginable that Arabia, elements of Arabia would be in that type of state, state of safety and security. Because the great nations of the world, the superpowers, and the most powerful force of that day was the, was the, the Sassanians, the Persians, the Persian Empire was the most powerful force of that day. And then, just as the, in the manifestation of the time of the Prophet ﷺ, we see a type of last breath of the Byzantines, of the Romans, against Persia. And that's we see the, the, the battle that is ultimately won by the Romans against the Persians who will begin to sweep all of Roman territory up until Alexandria. And now Hercules II, the first, the one who speaks to Abu Sufyan, Harakal, as the Prophet is going to call him, Avim of Rome. He calls him the great one of Rome, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's the one who gives Rome, the Byzantines, their last breath, and they begin to abate the power of Persia. And the Abyssinians, khalas, they, they will power, but they're just happy on the shores of Africa. And they don't really want to bother anybody. It's not an imperialist army, like the armies that the great civilizations of the African continent, like the greatest of them, the, the ancient Egyptians, they, they were not imperialistic in nature. It wasn't about will domination, so you don't see an expansion beyond their own territory, as you see with Rome. And as we see now with New Rome, like with America and Europe, we were expansionist in terms of their political, their political ideology. Okay, but it wasn't the case with the Abyssinians. And on the basis of that, the Prophet ﷺ said, He said, Leave them, ma'tarakukum, so long as they leave you. And so long as they don't approach upon you, they've got no imperialistic motives, or you see, yeah, and leave them alone. And that's why they were ultimately left alone. But the Prophet Sallallahu didn't say that about the Persians. He said, Futihat and Furus. Persians being conquered. He said, didn't say it about Rome. Futihat and Rome. Rome has been conquered. And although the Prophet Sallallahu did say it about the Turks, and when they rewind, he said, Utruk Turk, Metarakukum. Leave the Turks so long as the Turks leave, leave you. But the Turk was ultimately vanquished yeah, with, with Muhammad al Fatih in the conquering of Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, and which was formerly Byzantium. And the word by the Byzantiums is the old name for Constantinople. That's why you get the Byzantines or the Romans. Okay? So here, now, you're going to have what a state of security brought about. The point we were trying to stress is because those world powers understood the Arabs. That the Arabs, they were, like, they were wild warriors. I mean, you go into Arabia, despite the fact that the terrain is hostile, then you're going to meet very hostile people. And then now you conquer Arabia. What have you got? It's not like there's a lot of gold, there's a lot of land. The resources that you're going to need to subjugate the people you want to take from a land. Arabia doesn't have that in an obvious sense to the outward army. So just leave the Arabs alone so they were left alone. So the Arabs were also left just to fight amongst themselves. And that's what they did. Wild. And that's why it's called Ayyam Jahiliyyah. The years or the days of Jahiliyyah. And we said the way Jahiliyyah is not just ignorance, as you hear commonly translated, but Jahal yani, is like manifestations of rage and anger, which ultimately manifest in violence. Yani, the Arabs were very, very violent people. And the Prophet ﷺ was given the great task, divine task, of taming yani, these wild and sort of vicious and violent well, people who were the Arabs. And he did, sallallahu alayhi he did do that. But one of the things that we do see that the Prophet Sallallahu when he takes flight, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he was warning the companions, be careful of returning back to that old order. And when I take flight, such that you begin to strike the necks of each, the necks of each other. And that we're going to see manifest once again. We're going to see the old order manifest inside of Arabia. And one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to allow that situation as we as Muslims to come to terms with divine wisdoms behind it, one of them is to show the power of prophecy. How the Prophet sallallahu did the miracle of prophecy of bringing all of those into a state of absolute submission, state of security and peace, where swords were placed down. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala used to recount that we used to sleep 
with our swords. We just sleep in our beds with our swords. This is the time when what the state of safety and security was taken away, the time of war, which is sort of where we're at, we're about to bring that to a termination. Okay? But then by the end of prophecy, the swords were placed down. We said we didn't have to sleep with swords no more. Until Ayam Ali bin Abi Talib. And until Tal Ali bin Abi Talib, then we began to sleep with our swords once again. It became a time of war once again. That's the Sahaba. So we see that recounted in their own way through Allah Ta'ala and Warda. A peace to end all peace. So this is the year that follows what well, the great sort of um, siege of Medina to Munawara that is known as the Battle of Khandaq, in which what well, that which that we actually um, discussed in our last session. Shallah Ta'ala, we don't have the slides, so we'll read from the slides. In Shalan Surah Al Fatih in Fatahna Laka Fatan Mubina. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, we have granted you a clear victory. In Fatahna Laka Fatan Mubina. They are clear like Allah who met a Fatan in the Ambika or Metaka, that God may forgive you for your previous and latter faults and to complete divine favor upon you and to guide on a straight path and so God may help you with mighty assistance. That verse is a verse. Inshallah ta'ala that we would do well to understand one of the things, the premises that underpin it. And it's going to be a tradition that is raised by Sahil ibn Hunayf radiallahu ta'ala an the Sahihain of Imam al-Bukhari al-Muslim. The Sahil ibn Hunayf radiallahu ta'ala an he told the companions later, and this is during the time when the companions were about to yadribuna ba'aduhum unaqa ba'a. When they were, begin, they were about to go to war against each other and in the purity of their hearts, and the, 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 the desire for justice to be manifest upon the face of the earth, a fitna came about with the Sahaba ta'ala, and when armies of the Sahaba were raised against each other. And armies, we, history, we don't even, we can't even imagine like the armies of Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib going against the armies of Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Sufyan. Two, there's not only two Sahaba, but both of them could tab al-Wahi. Both of them are described as revelation in the, in the presence of Nabuwa, the presence of the Prophet sallam. How many battles? Have you done how many battles of Quraysh? No, we're not going to get double figures with the battles of Quraysh. We're only going to have two, three major battles and then a few skirmishes that we've seen early, in early Medani period. Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Muawiyah, they go to war, 70 battles, 70 wars against each other. Seven of oh, them, that's like a lot of fighting. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum wa arda. But what they were told by Sayyidina Sahar ibn Hunayn is ittahimu ar'a'akum. Yeah, they find fault in your own opinions. And they find fault in the way you see the world, okay? Because unless the way you see the world is totally aligned with the divine, i.e. how God sees the world. And you see that with the Prophet Sallallahu in his famous du'as, as an example, Allahumma arini haqqa haqqa wa rizuqni tiba'a. Oh Allah, show me reality as reality really is. Wa rizuqni tiba'a and give me the ability to follow it. Wa arini batila batila. And show me falsehood as it really is, not as I perceive it to be. Not from my perspective, but from the divine perspective. Or the Zukhan Ijtinaba, and give me the ability to shun it. Or you see in the famous hadith in Tirmidhi, the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah, rahma. Oh Allah, I ask you for a rahma, what type of mercy? Min indika, folk. A rahma from you, from your perspective. Not my perceptions of what mercy is, but divine reality of mercy. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa wa sallam. And it's the quest, the quest of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see things from the divine perspective, which can be frightening because a lot of times we cannot await, like many of us, mashallah, tabarakallah, we say, La ilaha illallah. What does La ilaha illallah mean? Yeah. From our perspective. But what does La ilaha illallah mean? From Allah ta'ala's perspective, when we utter it, they could correlate, but it could be what? Completely different. And one of them, subhanAllah, one of them, one of our teachers mentioned to the faqir that he what? He heard the lecture of one of the awliya, a person who had what? Who had been in khalwa, been in, in spiritual retreats for 70 years. Seven of oh. Imagine somebody getting yeah, alone 70 years, spiritual retreats, ma'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 70 years, okay? And when we sort of, we're shocked when we hear Imam al Jazuli, Rahimullah ta'ala, Sahib al Dala al Khairat, the author of Dala al Khairat was in Khalwa for 14 years, one four. And when he came out of Khalwa in the city of Fez and he walked through the city of Fez, the people of Fez cried and made tawbah on the sight of Jazuli because of the light that emanated from that being. 14 years. How can you imagine somebody who's in Khalwa for 70 years, Ma'ala subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the Kulli had that this individual was what? He was asked about an issue. That some daft people in our day and age, they're going to speak, make an inkar about the visiting of graves as an example. 
I'm going to call this shirk and bid'ah and kufr and warabi, whatever, all the terms they want to yani, innovate. Because the terms that they innovate don't understand the reality of it. Because that type of stuff is shirk and bid'ah and kufr. Then you're accusing the very messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who visited the graves in Bukhari, Muslim, the Sahih traditions. So he was asked about people who say that it's wrong. This person made khalwa for 70 years. He was asked about people who say it's wrong to actually visit the graves of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a new term and innovation. You don't hear that historically in, in, in Islam. And then his first question, uh, he was going to answer the question through a question, was, Ma hiya kalimatuhum? What is the way that they utter? He wants to understand their reality. What's the way that they utter? The kalima. Uh, what is the way that clarifies their reality? Because their identity. And then the person said, يَقُولُونَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ They say, لَا إِلَى إِلَى اللَّهِ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ There's no God for Allah. And Muhammad is the messenger of God وسلم, And then he said, and this is the profound, the profundity of the answer of Wilayah, that he says, لا. He said, that's not their word. He says, their word is, لَا إِلَى إِلَى اللَّهِ كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ That there is no God but Allah and Muhammad was the messenger of God. And what we're saying about that, that this is the, the tongue of wilaya, the tongue of what? Of, um, of sanctity, of sainthood. And one of the things we know about that in the Hadith al-Bukhari, Abu Huraira, that kuntu sam'u I become the ears by which they hear the awliya, the eyes by which they see the awliya, the tongue by which they speak the awliya, the hand by which they grasp the awliya, that the feet by which they walk, the awliya. Hadith al-Sahih al-Bukhari, Hadith Qudsi, Allah Ta'ala, defining the reality of the awliya. I went, endama yatakallamun, that when they speak, yatakallamun bi kalam Allah, bi nurillah. That they speak with the words of God, the light of Allah Ta'ala, from the perspective of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. And we should fear in and of ourselves that reality is not a projection onto others from within the ummah, but it should be a projection onto ourselves that when we utter words, not what is our perspective of those words? But what is the perspective of the divine? And you can only sort of begin to traverse that path to attain that reality if you listen to Sahih ibn Hunayn, ittaqimu arra'akum. Find fault in your opinions. Because it's not as it seems. And then he recounts himself, yani the current, I remember, I am Abu Jandal. I remember the days of Abu Jandal, which is what we're about to move into, Hudaybiyah. The days of Abu Jandal were I to be given the opportunity to belie the messenger of God, to say, you ain't true, you ain't real, I would have did it. But it was Adab that kept him silent, I, his mind's going wild, because he's seeing something from his perspective, but he's failing to understand that لَا يَخْرُجُ مِنْ هَذَا إِلَى الْحَقِّ the, the, the nature of prophecy, nothing comes from my mouth except truth. Yani the Nubuwa, like what is faith? What is faith to be a Muslim? Faith is not just to believe. Faith is two realities. Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, Fakhrin al-Razi and others mentioned it's not just a belief in the content of the Messenger of Allah, that what he says is true, but it's to believe he is true. Yani, trustworthy one is true. And in modern yani Cartesian world, we create a dichotomy between the speaker and what that is spoken. But the reality is that they intertwine, intrins intrinsically bound together, inextricably bound together. Yeah, if you believe, you make denial of anyone, you're a disbeliever. That's Islam, i'tiqad. Yeah, he's truthful, but he could have yeah, he said something which weren't so true. He speaks the truth, but he's just a man. And he's not trustworthy in and of himself. And that's why Al-Bukhari and Muslim, that's why Imam in Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, when he spoke about the Prophet who was Sadiq, was Masduq. There's the two words. Sadiq al Masduq. Sadiq. His content is truthful. He only speaks the truth, but also masduq. What's masduq? He himself is trustworthy. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what's your business? What's your problem? Finding fault with the way to the messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The adab of the sahaba, what was their adab? Silence. That's one of the things they learned in Hadrat al nubuwa They learned just to be silent. So it's the mind. There's a beauty in that. You see, one of the problems of us in Western Islam, we've got an issue, we're going to articulate it. We, got, I, we don't know the art of silence. Sometimes we just got to bury it deep until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes it. 
And that's why the Prophet in Sahih al Bukhari, he said, Al Bala Mu'akkal bil Mantiq. He said that tribulations are inextricably tied to where it's manifest, to what you say. You want to stay with a lot of tribulations in your life, keep stum, be silent, even when you find something to be problematic, because it may not, it may just not be as it seems to be to you. And that's one of the lessons the Sahaba who get, that's what this base is. And in the midst of what they consider to be a crisis, and the crisis is now touching upon their very belief in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Allah Ta'ala reveals it. We've given you a manifest victory. And they're like, like, what victory is this? This is the sort of lesson of Hudaybiyah, as we'll see. Okay? On the authority of Al-Bara ibn Azib, the great companion, Sahabi, one of the wasafun, one of the people who describe the nature of prophecy, the physical form of prophecy, Sayyid Al-Bara, the youngster who becomes Muslim as a child. You consider the opening to you consider the opening to be the opening of Mecca. You consider the great Fatih to be Fatih Mecca. And what's the Fatih there? Many consider it to be Ahl al Mecca. For amongst them, some Sahaba, saying Abdullah ibn Abbas, will so say the Fatih, Fatih Mecca. Fatih Mecca. Okay? And the opening of Mecca was an opening, Bara says. Yes, it was a Fatih. He says, however, we, Ma'ashir al Sahaba, the Sahaba, we consider the opening to be the compact of pleasure on the day of Hudaybiyah. Bay'at al Ridwan wal Hudaybiyah. That's what is the Fatih to us. And that's the great victory of Islam. Okay? Because why? Ultimately, it's going to abate war with the actual Quraysh. And the war with the Arabs now will essentially cease. And now the Prophet Sallallahu can now begin to address the world. Full, complete manifestation of his prophetic mission. As we see in the following year, now we begin to address the entire world. Okay? And from a position of power, if you imagine an opening letter, and you days you the king of Rome, and you open up a letter from a man you barely heard of in the Vahir, and a letter says, become Muslim and you'll be safe. I <laughs> mean, become Muslim, you can't be safe. Like, who, is, who is this? And that's why I look at the Persians, the great power, he gets like, what? He just rips up the letter and throws it down. And Nafi Kalam, not even a, and a discourse, who he is, throw the letter. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he comes, um, he, he, and he says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdullah ibn Hudhafa, Abdullah ibn Hudhafa tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Mazza he ripped up your letter, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet says, Mazlaqar Risalati. He ripped up my letter. Wallahu you mazik mulkahu temzik. Allah will whip his kingdom to shreds. That's the only kalam of prophecy when that happened. That's a power that comes from Hudaybiyah in the outward sense. Okay? Sam bin Thabit said in response to the words of Abu Sufyan ibn Hadith ibn Abdul Muttalib. He spoke ill of Muhammad, so I respond on his behalf. In that regard, my reward, my reward lies with none but God. He spoke ill of Muhammad, righteous and pious, the messenger of God, whose insignia is fidelity. Do you speak ill of him when you are not his equal? May the good amongst you be a ransom for the evil. Okay, this is Hassan bin Thabit, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, speaking or defending the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the slaves that are still coming from Quraysh. It's moved from really being a physical war now to an exchange of words. And obviously this is one of the most sort of um, difficult people for the Prophet Sallallahu to speak against him because it's someone who is beloved to him, Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith. Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith ibn Abdul Muttalib. I am a direct cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu and the son of the eldest of the sons of Abdul Muttalib al-Harith. His name is Abu Sufyan and he was very close to the Prophet Sallallahu before prophecy. But when the Prophet ﷺ declares prophecy, then he, what, he begins to what, move away from the messenger and be then begins to disparage and try to ridicule the messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sides more with Abu Lahab from the Hashimis, his uncle as opposed to siding with the Prophet ﷺ, as well as whom? As well as Abu Talib, inside on that side. And it becomes problematic. He really hates the messenger of Allah ﷺ by virtue of that. Okay, and that's why you see he's going to become Muslim later. He goes Muslim at um, Fatih Mecca. Fatih Mecca, when the army of prophets is approaching Mecca, that's when he's going to become Muslim. He comes out with like the brother of Um Salama and others, comes out to become Muslim, becomes Muslim. And when he approaches the Prophet, the Prophet has been sent to guide people to Allah Ta'ala, Prophet refuses to even face him. No, Prophet no, 
refuses, refuses, refuses. Until uh, this Abu Sufyan ibn al-Hamid, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu he swears an oath, an oath, <coughs> that if he does, he has this young son with him. And he says, he says, send a message. They send a message to Umm Salama, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who is with the messenger of Allah as they approach Mecca, that if he doesn't allow me to become Muslim and forgive me, I'm going to wander the deserts of Arabia. Hatenamut, until we die, me and my son, Ju'an, we die out of hunger. And it's when the Prophet saw some hear those words from Salama that may see them begins to manifest and embraces them into the fold of Islam. And if we said thereafter that Abu Sufyan, the one who's disparaging the Prophet, he becomes somebody so full of remorse for all those years that never from that day on did he ever look in the face of the Messenger of Allah. He would never tell the Prophet would enter, he would lower himself out of sort of disgust how he used to treat the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. This is Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith. So they can be placed as prominent people because the Quraysh now is also a war of words after what? After Khandaq. Because they now war has destroyed them. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells them this. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the basis of what? Of revelation. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to now go towards Mecca and instruct the companions that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed that now we make what? A visitation to the house, the minor visit, the Umrah. We're going to go to the house, it's been seen inside of a dream. And he saw it in the dream, even the shaving of heads. That they're going to shave their heads after performing the rites. So he commands the companions now that we prepare to go for what is a year after Khandaq. And now we go for Umrah. Okay, so the Prophet وسلم, sets out with the companions and they're They're not carrying weapons of war. Except that the message, except that they carry their swords, but not as weapons of war, but just as what? That's just part of the honor of Arabia. Man always has his sword with them, but it wasn't as a we- weapon of war. And you're not going to see them with their bows, you're not going to see them with other, but steed ready for war. Okay? And they're going to be dressed in ihram. And so as they approach Mecca to Mukarramah, then we see the great camel Qaswa. Qaswa is going to buckle, the great camel Qaswa, the Prophet وسلم, buckles. As it approaches Mecca at Hudaybiya, and then the Sahaba begin to sort of beat the camel, Qaswa, and he move. The Prophet is on the camel, and then the camel won't move. That's why it's Qaswa, the fair one, footed one, they can't move the camel. So they, then they begin to sort of disparage Qaswa, saying Qaswa is being stubborn. And then the Prophet said, That's an attribute the camel does not know. And this camel is a camel of adab, high etiquette. And it's a camel, remember, when we entered into Medina to Munawwara, Da'ha, Innaha Ma'mura. Leave the camel, Qaswa. Ma'mura, she's under divine command. I, a camel that has a vertical relationship with the Lord of the world. So the Prophet Sallallahu and then said, what is buckled Qaswa is what buckled the elephants of Abraha. I, when the elephants of Abraha approached the Kaaba to destroy the Kaaba, the elephants out of awe for the Kaaba. It wasn't the intentions of the Abyssinians. This is the awe of the Kaaba, the Holy Land, forced them to buckle the elephants until they, they put iron inside the noses of the camels and I mean, of the elephants and they were trying to force the elephants to move forth, the Abyssinians, elephants wouldn't until they turned the elephants towards the south, towards Yemen the elephants rose and would move then they would turn them back towards the Kaaba, towards Mecca the elephants would buckle again, they couldn't move and as in there in the midst of fighting with the elephants that's when the Ababil, the battle array of, 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 of birds begin to arrive and to begin to destroy the Abyssinian army but it was the awe for sacred territory, and they say with Qaswa, Qaswa the awe for sacred territory. And then we take a theme from that, like when we're on, you see Saudi Airlines or BA or whatever A it is, and we're heading towards holy territory, when have we buckled? You see, that's our tradition of people going towards Mecca, going towards Medina, buckling. Not just animals, but imams, people of religion, because of the awe they have for that sacred territory. We don't know the reality of Mecca from the divine perspective. We don't know the reality of Medina from the divine perspective. But if our hearts were hearts that were aligned with that reality, then we would see a very, very, very different place in terms of those two sacred cities. And Qaswa the Kamal demonstrates that and for the Prophet as he was one to demonstrate. And he goes into Mecca, he's buckling as he goes into Mecca, never enters Mecca on beast foot, walking. What the clear for us? And you know, you got your taxi, stop outside the city, I walk into this city. 
That's the qiyas for us. You don't drive into Mecca, you walk into the city. That's sunnah, the message of Allah bin Ma'ali from the topmost point. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa look at him, you can see him in fact, and Mecca sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, barefoot, walks into Mecca sallallahu alayhi wa Look at the Prophet, as the beast approaches, as he poses back to Mecca, he's prostrate, his head is prostrating upon his beast sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His, his camel has a ragged rag as a, as a savage, as a, as a saddle. His hairs are in braids, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, dressed as a Bedouin, hairstyle of the Bedouin, to show you his humility. I'm going into sacred territory. Yeah, we go all in our full back, head, heading towards the sky as if we somebody, now we in Mecca. And it's something wrong, hearts of our distant the age in which we're in, from the reality that we see with the Sahaba, radiallahu Prophet eventually forces um, Qaswa to, uh, to arise and they move further until he asks the companions to alight at Hudaybiyah. So they're going to alight at a place called Hudaybiyah, proximity to Mecca, obviously between Mecca and Medina, but in proximity to Mecca. And then the Prophet وسلم, now wants to send ahead, he wants to send ahead somebody to actually speak to the Quraysh and to, uh, to inform them that we come for Umrah. This war is not intended. And the Quraysh or the Nabi have to allow that. They can't stand in the way of anybody who intends the house. So the Prophet is going to send the great ambassador. And the great ambassador of the Prophet, because he was his great role in Jahiliyyah, was whom? Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn al-Khattab was an ambassador of Quraysh in Jahiliyyah. So the Prophet Prophet's opinion, yani manifest, is sent Umar ibn al-Khattab to go and walk, go and speak to the Quraysh that we come for Umrah. Umar ibn al-Khattab says, Ya O Messenger of Allah, I'm the last one they want to see. It ain't going to go down too well if I go to Mecca. So Umar ibn al-Khattab said, A better person to send is whom Uthman ibn Affan. Send Uthman. And the reason why he wants to see send Uthman because Mecca now is on lockdown by Banu Umayyah. The leaders of Mecca, leadership was transferred from Makhzum to Umayyah. We saw that at the Battle of Uhud. Because that Badr, the Mahzumites, who were leader in Mughira, Amr ibn Hisham Abu Jahl, Banu Mahzum, they destroyed. And so now it's Banu Umayyah. And remember, the thing about Banu Umayyah, which again is important, their war. Banu Umayyah is war from its history, uh, from time immemorial, from Umayyah, Abdul Shams, Harb, the father of Abu Sufyan, who was the greatest warrior of his day, the leader of the army of Quraysh, to Abu Sufyan, the leader who leads to Uhud and leads the Khanna up until the end of time the Sufiani, Banu Umayyah are a tribe of war and now they've got Mecca upon lockdown led by Abu Sufyan and so Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab's opinion is now who do you send and look it's, it's, it's astute because it's not just send an Umayyad that Uthman ibn Affan is from Banu Umayyah but Uthman is special because yani, he's Banu Umayyah but he doesn't have Yani, war in his blood at all. He doesn't have an atom of war in him. Saying that Uthman, he's like Ashbah bin Malaika. The Prophet Sallallahu said he's the, of, the, of the Sahaba, the one who resembles the angels most. And angels, as we mentioned previously, they don't battle, they don't do war. That's not what angels do. I mean, when they fought in Badr and Uhud, they had to be taught. In the Quran, they were taught how to fight because they don't know how. That's Uthman. So send Uthman, one, he's Umayyad, first. So now this gave him affinity on tribal reasons. But also number two, they don't see any threat from him. He's not going to come with the, the, yani the, the posture of war. So the Prophet Sallallahu agreed to send Uthman. So when Uthman ibn Affan now goes to what Mecca, Quraysh, yani embrace, Banu Umayyah embrace, yani Uthman ibn Affan, but now they send this information back to the Prophet Sallallahu and what comes back to the Messenger of Allah is that Uthman ibn Affan has been killed, that the Quraysh took him and killed him. That's a dis- it was disinformation they sent to the Messenger of Allah. The Prophet وسلم, al-hukm ala dhahir. That he interacts with this word, hukm ala dhahir, that's deen, that you act in accordance to what is obvious. Even if you're sahib al-kashf, even if you're sahib al nubuwa you know the reality, you don't, you don't interact with the reality, you interact with the manifestation. True or false, that's deen, that's correct saluk. So the Prophet وسلم, then shows the companions out of act. The Prophet وسلم, first says that if they have killed Uthman ibn Affan, if, that, yeah, that if, the if <laughs> I will weep havoc upon them. They killed Uthman. And that is really, really important, that statement right there. Why? As we see many statements inside of Hudaybiyah, that statement is going to be etched into the hearts of the companions. When? 
does not manifest when Uthman is killed. And when Uthman ibn Affan is eventually killed, yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about another 25 odd years later, he's eventually murdered, assassinated inside of his own house, and his certain companions that they lose it in one sense, because it goes back to that statement of the Messenger of Allah, you kill Uthman. And Uthman ibn Affan. And the Sahaba, and the Aisha couldn't understand it. Zubair couldn't understand it. Talha couldn't understand it. And the Imams of the Sahaba couldn't take that, Ali. And to them, to the point where they are going to listen to Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and if something's gone wrong, let us sort the situation out. We'll get to the bottom of this. They can't even hear Ali ibn Abi Talib, the leader of the state. Where did the killers come from in Iraq? Raise the army, go to Iraq. Ali say, no, leave Ali alone. We're going to Iraq. And they raise the armies, go to Iraq, lock down Iraq, to try and find the culprits who kill Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. But the point being the history of it goes back to that statement of the Messenger of Allah. They killed Uthman, I will reap havoc upon them. So that's going to be etched into the hearts of, of the companions radiallahu anhu. And then the Prophet sallallahu commands the companions beneath the acacia. Get everyone to the tree. What is he instructing? Bay'ah. It's going to be now a new oath. And that's going to be called Bay'ah to the one. Of the people who related is the great woman, Nusayba. And in Radiallahu ta'ala anhu Nusayba, or the correct pronunciation of her name is Nasiba. Nasiba Radiallahu ta'ala anha, woman, warrior, highest level. We hear that at what? At Uhud. Uhud, she's one of the bodyguards of the Prophet of Uhud. Protects Jalib and Nabuwa. And a woman, Nusayba, she's the one who helped take out Ibn Khamiha. And she has the gashes from the battle with Ibn Khamiha until the day she died. And as we mentioned upon Riwayah, she's the one who kills what Musaylim al Kadhab in the wars of the companions later against the liar prophet Musaylim al Kadhab. This is a warrior at the highest level, Sayyidina the Nasiba. Radiallahu anha, she's the one who hears it. And she says, When I hear the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi say those words beneath the tree, or she understood, and she took the bay'ah at Aqaba, the bay'ah of war. She took that bay'ah in Mecca, early days with the Ansar, the Ansariya. So when she heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that, she said, I immediately armed myself. Where to find some type of knife, anything that I could, I could stab someone with, and then I needed something else. So what did she see? She's a tent. She strips the tent, takes the pole, and she comes to the tree just ready and armed, saying that Nasiba. And that is going to be the great bay'ah, okay? And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and God will say, Be pleased with the believers when they pledge loyalty to you under the tree. Surah Al Fatih. And Allah was the Radi Allah, and in Mu'mini, if you bear tahta shajar. That God was saying, we pleased with the believers when they pledged loyalty to you under the tree, knowing what was in their hearts. What's inside of their hearts, Yani that? I mean, we don't even have, we're not even ready for war. Everything's back in Medina, we're stripped. And now, what this is like, Yani, it's like suicide in one sense, that we're taking a bay'ah for war. That's it. If a man is dead, not like go back to me to get ready. War, we face Quraysh now. Uh, that, it takes, Yani, different type of heart, a heart that is totally confident to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's what you see with the Sahaba. Munafiqun, no. Some of the Munafiqun were present, some of them were hiding behind camels. I got to hide behind a camel. They were like hiding behind camels, like, please don't let them see me and call me to the bay'ah. That's what they did, Munafiqun. They left for day they never took the bay'ah. Uh, because those, and one of the things, not like they never took it, Allah barred them from it. Because the people that have the bay'at of the one, they become elite companions, every single one of them. They're the ones, every one of them are the ones who are going to take khaybah later on the instruction of Allah Ta'ala inside of the Qur'an. So knowing what was in their hearts, sending tranquility down upon them, Allah steadied their hearts. And reward them with ready victory and abundant spoils. Where's the manifestation of that? Khaybah. That's, that's the abundant spoils. It's going to happen a year later, a year and a half later, which they take as God is Almighty, most wise. And the Prophet وسلم, takes the bay'at, all the hands come together, and then he places his hand on it, and then he said, takes his other hand, his left hand, and he said, This is for Uthman. And then the Prophet places two hands above all the hands of the companions for the actual, the actual pledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called that hand God's hand, Allah's hand. Yadullah. The hand of Allah is above their hand. That's the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. And were you to gaze with your eyes from your perspective, you'll see the hand of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What does that statement tell you about who he is? In Allah. From the perspective of Allah. Jalla fil And so they're ready for war. Ready for war. Okay? 
or is eventually going to, and that's what the statement you hear, we have this in the asylum which said, of the Prophet there is no good in life after Uthman, by God, if they have killed him, I will wreak, ha- wreak havoc upon them. Okay? Tayyib. What happens? Hmm? Is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallam is now the Quraysh are going to send, trying to find a slide here, the Quraysh are going to send um, messengers out. So they're going to now, when they realize it's totally clear, there's not an issue, of, there's not an issue first and foremost, of any ulterior motive. That's one. But then the second reality, which is subtle, when news gets back to the Quraysh, these people are going to come to battle us in that type of state. The Quraysh now, what do we do? And this is the cleverness of Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan now is going to send what? He's going to send messengers out. First, information, of man's alive. Okay? Now they're going to send out messengers. Like, what is it that you want? Quraysh send them one by one. First one is like, at that point, Budayr bin Warqa al-Khuzari arrived. Saying, verily, I have just left Quraysh and they are preparing to fight you. It's this information. And to prevent you from the house, he ain't coming to the house, you're not coming to the Kaaba. So the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have not set out to fight with anybody, but we have come to perform the mind of the Ugumin. We come to do Umrah. It's not an issue of war. And the Prophet Sallam then tells the Quraysh their reality. Moreover, war has brought great harm to the Quraysh. And I mean, war has destroyed your society. So if they desire Quraysh, I can declare a truce with them on the condition that they don't stand in the way of me. They don't obstruct me and the people. And if it becomes manifest, then they are free to enter into that which people have already entered into and a treaty. Otherwise, they have at least relieved themselves of war for a period of time. Then, I, the Prophet is telling Quraysh that war, cessation of war, peace, is in your best interest. He's not speaking from a position of weakness. And for us to try and understand it, this, a year before this, Arabia had surrounded Medina, only a year before the Battle of Khanda, and now he's speaking like it's in your best interest, not ours. We're ready, look, ready for war. So if they refuse, the Prophet ﷺ said, I shall fight them by God, I shall fight them over this affair until the day I, until the day, until the day, and until the day I, I, I manifest victory, and God will surely make them taste this affair. Budeo said, I shall convey to them what you have said. I'm just a messenger. I'm going to tell them exactly what you have said. He's the first messenger, and he returns back to the Quraysh, and khalas, that's it. This is the message that Muhammad sallallahu gives you. That's what he conveys. The next one that they send, that they send like a Bedou. They send a Bedouin. So they take a Bedouin from the Qara, one of the chiefs of the Bedouin tribes, send him, go and see what he wants. The Quraysh, one after one, Abu Sufyan. So as this Bedouin approaches, and this is again the Prophet ﷺ, his penetrating vision, the Prophet ﷺ, one of his great reality, of his khalq, of his physical form, this is the vision that he had. Uh, in the Bahari, rahimahullah ta'ala, others report that the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith, transmission of the Prophet ﷺ could see in the night what he could see in the day. Uh, the alternation of night and day never obstructed the vision of the Prophet ﷺ. That the Prophet ﷺ had 360 peripheral vision, hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. From the front, he could see everything. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never had to turn his head. He never turned his head in his entire life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except in salah, except the assalamu alaykum. So he turned his head, turned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Likewise, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his penetrating vision, this, he could see all of the stars of the Pleiades. That he, 11, 12 stars of the Pleiades, different rewires. And human beings can only see six or seven. And he could see all of them then from his miracle, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, reports, a hadith sahih. Penetrating vision. Point being is that when the Bedou, the chief of the Bedou, he's approaching from a distance, great distance, approaching the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ahudaybi and the companions, the Prophet Sallallahu instructs the companion, sees him from that distance, identifies him and his reality, and says, this is a Bedouin that approaches, يُعَذِّمْ الْكَعْبَ شَعَرِ الْكَعْبَ that he, yani, he reveres the sacred symbols of the Kaaba. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, take the camels, Okay, the camels that they have, okay, that you brought, they brought the hedi, they brought a sacrifice for the house, and you take the camels and just put them in the open so you can see the camels. Because when he sees the camels, he's going to like, that's all he needs to see, that they're coming 
to yuan them, to revere for sacred reasons. And so the Bedouins come and come and they oh, he just sees all of these camels, oh, he doesn't even go to the master, turns around, goes back to Mecca and says, leave them alone. These people, you have vimun al Kaaba, that they've come to really want, to really revere, revere the rights of the holy place. And the Quraysh like, what, what, what did he say? I didn't have to see him. I just saw the camels. They said, can Bedouin, what do you know about things? No. Okay, so they send him away. So then the third person at this point in time, the man enters into the scenario, and who's his name? He's Urwa ibn Mas'ud al Faqafi. The next Urwa ibn Mas'ud al Faqafi. Urwa ibn Mas'ud al Faqafi, as we learned before, he is like one of the two men, great men of Arabia. The first one's been killed, Walid ibn al Khaira, he's gone. So he's the one who remains Urwa ibn Mas'ud al Faqafi, the head of Faqif, of Ta'if. Important man, great importance, as you'll see. So he approaches Quraysh. And he said, leave it to me, yani, let me go and speak to this person, let me go and see, okay? And that's why he says in this tradition here, so he left thereafter, reached the Quraysh and told them what the people had said. Thereby Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi arose and said, Badly this presents you with a path of guidance, let us see and what this is. Immediately accept it, let me go, let me go to Muhammad, and yani, he's speaking about peace, maybe we should take the word the avenue of peace. Remember Urwa, yani, maybe he's got that in him. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu in Al-Bukhari, he says about Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi, he said, Ra'aytu Isa ibn Maryam. And you saw Jesus, the son of Mary, wa idha achbah bihi shabaha. The one who resembles him the most, if you to see him, is Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi. And you saw Urwa ibn Mas'ud, it's like you're looking at Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salam. Hadith in Al-Bukhari. Okay, and you know, Jesus, in terms of the first mission, is the Prophet of Peace. In the, in the great extreme sense, the Prophet of Peace saying that Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam. So you see the inclination of Urwa at this point for peace. So Urwa now goes to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He thereby went unto him and began to see, speak to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whilst taking note of his companions. And Nusayba radiallahu anha, she now observes Urwa. And that's important. Now Nusayba, she could release the hadith. I see the bodyguard. And when Urwa comes, and what's this? And this is... This is a big man, yeah, he's coming. And he could have evil intent. So the Sabah observes, and she's the one who says the Prophet is sitting cross legged, Murabba. He's sitting cross legged, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not a normal position of his. And he said, Urwa is upon his knees in front of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi And he's shadowed by companions. Companions are shadowed him, Urwa, as what is it? And Urwa, as he enters, and I'm Urwa. And when he sits in front of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on his knees, he takes hold of the beard of the Prophet That's a sign of I'm Urwa. You're beneath me in stature. Holds the beard. And the Prophet and the Sahaba Talha and others, they unsheathe their swords. And then they take the blunt side of the sword and smack the hand of Urwa. And it's on the beard of the Prophet And he said, next time it's your neck. You dare do that again to hold the beard of the Prophet We'll sever your neck. And not even like, look at Umar ibn al-Khattab, Ya Rasulullah, give me permission to sever his neck. Umar Adab would ask for permission. At that point, they even ask the Messenger of Allah, you do that again, who will sever your neck? Uh, don't touch him like that. He said, but no Urwah is, is intelligent, and the leaders are really intelligent. And that's what the Arab is an Arab proverb, that Laysa Sayyid, Laysa Sayyid al qawm bi ghabi, that the leader of a people is not stupid, walakin, however, al mutaghabi but he fakes stupidity, leadership. You gotta to pretend to be stupid sometimes in order to maintain leadership. That's the part of the dexterity of leaders. So Urwa now is doing things. Why? Showing you leadership qualities, saying that Urwa bin Mas'ud al Why? He wants to suss out the entire situation. And he's gonna judge the Prophet as we see the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, judge the Prophet by how the Sahaba relate to him. And how do these people see him? That's how I'll ultimately determine whether these are people we should fight or not. And he's just seeing reverence after reverence in observation. Uh, thereby the Prophet Sallallahu addressed him with a word similar to that of Budayl, verbatim, and Urwa thereby returned to the Quraysh. Goes back to Quraysh and said, Oh people, by God, I've visited kings. And you know me, I'm Urwa ibn Sruda Fatafi. I know the nation of kings. I visited Khasros. The leader of Persia, fi mulkihi, in his dominion. I visited Caesar, fi mulkihi, in his dominion. I visited Nagashi, the Negus of Abyssinia, in his dominion. The three powers, superpowers of the world. 
But I have not seen a king who is exalted by his subjects in the same way the companions of Muhammad exalt Muhammad. He says, I haven't seen anybody treat anybody that way. And then he goes on, by God, never does he excrete saliva, spit, except that it falls into the, the, a man's palm and he thereby wipes it over his face and body. Uh, as what Uba says, Hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, whenever he commands something, they move swiftly to comply. And in riwayat, he doesn't even have to speak sometimes, sallallahu alayhi wa he just motions. And the Sahaba understand the signs and move swiftly to do whatever he's motioning towards. When he performs ablution wudu, yataqatalu, they fight over the remnants of his water. This is what he's seeing in front of, in front of his own eyes. Whenever he speaks, they lower their voices in his presence and they do not stare at him out of reverence for him. You don't look at him in the face, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Verily, he has presented you an excellent offer, so accept it. That's it. Accept the offer. In the beginning, when he says this, they say, Have you become a Muslim? He said, No. I'm just telling you reality here. I don't follow him. I'm telling you reality that I observe. Once he spoke, the wind is bond, it's over now. Uruwa, the great Uruwa has spoken. And now what do Quraysh decide? They decide to send the great negotiator. And who's that? Suhail bin Amr. Suhail bin Amr, the great negotiator. And he fasih al lisan one of the extreme eloquence. Okay, unto him. And when he approaches, when he now approaches the Prophet and he goes, he's the last of the messengers of Quraysh. But he's not a messenger, he's a negotiator. Okay, you'll negotiate a treaty. Are you going to see how great he is? I mean, his negotiation makes the Sahaba fall into a state of near bankruptcy in the Messenger of Allah. That's how good he was, because the Sahaba couldn't believe the terms he negotiated in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And that's, you've got to give credit to Uruba, I mean, to, to, to Suhail bin Amr. So when he arrives, as he's approaching the Prophet, you see two perspectives. His perspective is Umar ibn al Khattab. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he sees Suhail bin Amr, he knows Suhail, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, but look at the adab, he asks, O Messenger of Allah, just give me permission to rip out his teeth. That's all I want to do. You want to strike his neck, I want to rip out his teeth. He's too slick with his tongue, can he? This one. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, Suhail bin Amr, look, he makes a play upon his name, Sahu al Amr. I, it's all easy now. The affairs become easy. If it's Suhail, it's all easy. It's a done deal. That's what we, I see by that. Play upon the name just to show you Suhail bin Amr, Sahu al Amr, the Prophet said. And Suhail comes in and sits with the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sahih Wasallam. Face with come, write in contract between us and yourself. On a contract. So who is the Prophet Sahih from Summan? Ali ibn Abi Talib. Describe. Summan saying Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the Prophet Sahih says, write Bismillah Rahman al Rahim. He begins his letters, right hook to Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib is about to write. Sayyidina Ibn Amr stops. He says, Suhail says, as for the beneficent ar-Rahman, he says, by God, not aware of who he is. We don't know ar-Rahman. He says, so write Bismika Allahumma in your name, O God. Write that. Okay, write that. And then, he shows you his cleverness. As you yourself used to write. I used to believe in that. He's yourself to say, Bismik Allah, Ummah. What's the problem with that? You have your common ground. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, Oktob, Bismik Allah, Ummah. Like that. So that's the head of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Bismik Allah, Ummah, in your name, O God. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, This is what has been mutually adjudicated by Muhammad, agreed upon by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Messenger of God. They say, Ali bin Abi Talib, write it. So Ibn Amr says, By God. If we knew that you were the messenger of God, then we wouldn't have prevented you from the house, nor would be a fortune. We don't know you're the messenger of God, we don't believe that part of it. So write Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Ali ibn Abi Talib, and this one's already written it. That's important. <laughs> I didn't listen to that class. Pretend I didn't hear that part of it. Ali already wrote Muhammad Rasulullah. And the Prophet says, By God, I am the messenger of God, even if you deny me. It's not about your perspective of who I am. It's Allah Ta'ala's perspective. Write Muhammad the son of Abdullah. He says to Ali, write Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Let that one go. Uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib says, La. No, look, what is it? It's gone. It's gone. Not done deal. And the Prophet said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, and um, who? And he, and he erase it. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, No. 
not going to hurt his head. Uh, this is to the messenger of Allah. That is like outward disobedience. But sometimes the ulama who says sometimes disobedience is obedience. Like you see that with Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then the Prophet Sallallahu then tells Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ya Ali, he says, what is taking place right now is going to is going to occur in your lifetime to you. Tell Sayyidina Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib that. And what that? That's going to be 30 years later with the, with the last war, of the 70 wars with Sayyidina Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu. That war of Sayyidina Ali ibn Talib, where Sayyidina Ali ibn Talib now has vanquished the forces of Muawiyah. And Sayyidina Ali ibn Talib now is now about to finish the entire battle. The last of the battles, and Muawiyah Abu Sufyan, and the son of Abu Sufyan, who's the leader of Quraysh at this time, is extremely intelligent. So he instructs Amr ibn Aras, who's alongside him, instruct the warriors now to take Mus'hafs, take Qur'ans, and to place Qur'ans on the end of their swords, and to raise this, the Qur'ans aloft in the battlefield. Okay, why? Because they know the ta'adheem for the Mus'haf that Sayyidina Ali has. So they do that, the battle's about to end. And when Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib sees that, yeah, bring back the troops. Nobody fight, the Mus'haf is, is on the battlefield. Should not be so look at the nature of the, the respect of the Mus'haf. The general comes in Ali ibn Abi Talib and says, it, it, the battle's over, yeah, it's over, allow me to finish it. Sayyidina Ali ibn Talib says, no. He says, Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, allow me one rain, just one. Khalas, you're going to finish, that's all it takes to finish it. Sayyidina Ali ibn Talib says, no, no. And then what does Sayyidina Muawiyah call for? The truce. Call for the contract. And in that truce, the Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib now is going to secede. He's in effect going to give power to actual Sayyidina Muawiyah in the Levant, in Northern Arabia, in the capital city of Damascus, which is now later going to become the actual capital of Islam under Banu Umayyah, Damascus. Uh, and at that point, Sayyidina Ali ibn Talib giving up of power, that's what's going to sort of break the forces of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's when you see the manifestation of the Khawarij. You can't believe it. Same thing now. You've given a power to him? On what basis? On the next day, that's when they accuse Sayyidina Ali ibn Talib, you're not fit for leadership. And that's when they come with their foul statement, La hukma illa lillah. Only God has the right to judge. Human beings cannot judge, not fit for judgment. And Sayyidina Ali ibn Talib said, Kalimatul haq bi yuriduna bi al A true word they utter, but they mean by that falsehood. And they have a false intent behind it. But it's because, you see, the manifestation of this, point where now Sayyidina Ali ibn Talib is going to secede in order to maintain the lives of actual Muslims, to make sure blood is not going to be shed, and to maintain what the lives of Muslims is important, and that's what the Prophet ﷺ is clearly doing here, to maintain the lives of Muslims, but also to maintain the, li the lives of disbelievers, these people, okay? Tayyip. So therefore, then, so then the Prophet suddenly said, then that contract continues, leave the way open for us, I saw the Prophet Sallallahu and then said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, where is, is Rasulullah written? And Ali ibn Talib shows the Messenger of Allah here. The Prophet Sallallahu takes the pen of Ali and just puts a line through it. Just puts a line through it. And he says, Uktub ibn Abdullah. Now write the son of Abdullah. And Ali ibn Talib then writes the son of Abdullah. And then the Prophet Sallallahu says that they leave the way open for us to the house so that we can say, come on, and make tawaf. So Hail ibn Amr says, by God, we will not allow the Arabs to say that we were taken by force. From every point, he has contention and changes it. We're not going to allow the Arabs to say we were taken by force. We've got to save face. So let that be your prerogative in the forthcoming year. And you can come next year, not this year, go back to Medina. So it was written. Khalas, finished. Then Suhail said, Then let not a man from amongst us come unto you, except that you return them back to us. I, if a person becomes Muslim in Mecca, and makes the hijrah to Medina, you must send him back to Mecca. This is, for, this is now Suhail's point. Uh, even if he's upon your religion, okay, then the Muslims said, and but also in, in another riwayah, uh, but if a, if a person who's Muslim reneges, apostates, and goes to where? To Mecca, we don't have to turn him back to you. And so the Muslims said, SubhanAllah, they begin to speak now the Sahaba, and they can't believe that part. Glory be to God. How can we surrender somebody who's a Muslim to the Mushrikeen, to idolaters, when he's in fact a Muslim? How can we do that? Okay? So this commotion now amongst the Sahaba, the Prophet is still silent, so Ibn Amr has spoken. Look how Allah Ta'ala manifests events. At this point, somebody arrives. Who is the person? His name is Abu Jandal. We quoted him before. I remember the days of Abu Jandal. Abu Jandal has arrived, 
He comes into his Berak Hudaybiyah, he's in chains, which is what? He's broken, part of the chains. What has happened? He's somebody who became Muslim, was imprisoned inside of Mecca to Al-Mukarramah and tortured in Mecca. And then he managed to actually kill his captives and he fled. And now he's free in Mecca and on his way to Medina, there he is at Hudaybiyah. He sees the force of the prophecy and he sees what? Suhail bin Amr negotiating. What's the actual irony of him? Who's Abu Jannah? The son of Suhail bin Amr, the very son of him. And Suhail bin Amr sees the son who was kept captive and tortured in Mecca. Ah, Suhail bin Amr says, we start with him. The contract starts right here. They, this one's going to be sent back. Uh, okay, dragging his feet in chains. He left the lower parts of Mecca and found himself amongst them. And he'd have to be severely tortured for the sake of God. He said, O oh, company of Muslims, Abu Jannah, the son of Ibn Amr, begins to shout, Shall I be retained back to the idolaters after having came as a Muslim? Do you not witness what has happened to me? I've been tortured. Don't you see what they are doing to me? Thereby, Suhail says, This, O oh Muhammad, this one is the first one that I've decided that you must retain to me. Otherwise, by God, an oath, and I will fulfill their oaths, I will not enter into a covenant with you ever. Full stop, it's over. I walk. The Prophet said, Then we have not yet finished in determining the contract. The contract's not over yet. So leave him for me, just let him be. And he replies, to Ibn Amr, I'm not going to give him to you. And that's my son. He ain't getting that one. Huh? So then the commotion begins. Umar ibn Khattab then is going to what? He's going to intervene. Okay? Because what did the Prophet He mentioned to what? He mentioned, let it be. Let it go. Okay, retain him back. And then he turns towards Abu Jannah and he says to Abu Jannah, the Prophet said to Abu Jannah, Allah, you fell jank. Don't worry, Allah Ta'ala will take care of you. So, Sir bin Amr is with people, they take captive, they take him, Abu Jannah, his son, captive, get him back to Mecca. Abu Jannah is intelligent because he understands Kalam and Nabuwa. The Prophet said, Allah will take care of you. So, it's not just blind faith, Allah Ta'ala will take care of me. He's like, what does that mean? What's he trying to say? How will Allah take care of me? And he sees the means. And what he understood from that, that if Allah placed you in a position where you were held captive and tortured, and you got out of that situation, you can get out of that situation again. Seek the means. And so on his way back to Mecca, what does he do? He mutually kills the captives once again. Kills them and then flees. But he understands, can't go to Mecca, can't go to Medina. He had the contract. So Abu Jandal then does, he goes to buy the Red Sea. He goes to buy the Red Sea and he establishes a Bedouin encampment. And then what's going to happen is that those people, this is when the treaty is all done and done, done and dusted, those people who become Muslim in Mecca, they know they can't go to Medina. So what do they do? They all flee to Abu Jandal and his Bedouin encampment. That's where they all begin to live, Abu Jandal, Abu Basir, becomes a famous encampment, okay? What begins to happen, what do they do? They stick up men. So what do they do? They begin to hit the caravans of Quraysh. Stick up men, caravan after caravan going towards the Levant. Until Quraysh, yeah, it's threatening trade, Quraysh then goes, Abu Sufyan sends Quraysh to Medina and, and pleads with the Prophet Sallallahu let's rub that out the contract, let them go to you, they destroy your business. And prophets are, I see this as part of the victory later. Oh, let them be. And so the whole encampment is then collapsed. And all of Abu Jandal, Abu Basir, they all yeah, live in the yeah, yeah. uh, What happens now? Umar ibn Khattab speaks. Uh, and Umar now, I need two ways we can look at it. The greater way of Ibn Abi Jamra is Umar now is speaking on behalf of companions who have problems inside of their hearts. Not that Umar has a problem, but companions do, as we see in the statements of the Sahaba. So Umar now, are you not truly the Prophet of God? Let's tell Rasulullah, Nabi Allah, are you not the Prophet of God? And the Prophet says, Bala, of course I am. And he says, are we not upon truth and our enemies upon falsehood? The Prophet says, Bala, indeed, of course I am. So why then are we attributing humiliation to our religion? Umar says, this is the mafloom of some of the companions. And the Prophet says, Verily in me Rasulullah, Verily I am the messenger of God, and I am not in disobedience to him, to God. And he is my victor. Allah grants victory, remember that. Umar ibn Khattab then says to the Prophet Did you not used to say that we would come into the house and say, Come and it? Did you say we were going to make Umrah? Did you tell us that? That's why we're here. You told us that. 
And the Prophet ﷺ said, indeed, bala. He said, well, did I say this year? <laughs> now you want to take it literally, honey, that's your business. But did I say this year? Is that what I said? And Omar said, no, no, you didn't say this year. The Prophet ﷺ said, verily, you will come on to it in the sake of Amr. He said, don't, be, don't, be, don't worry about what I said, because it's all true. But it's when does God manifest that? Umar now wants to show you, because the companions could be like, well, cave. Yeah, I mean, that's the way that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how are we supposed to be as companions with him? So Umar then, who does he go to? Abu Bakr. Go to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Look at the conversation. So he goes to Abu Bakr, who had so far been absent, wasn't there, and says, oh, Abu Bakr, is this not truly the Messenger of God? Is he not the Rasul Allah Haqqa? Abu Bakr said, Bala, of course he is. He said, are we not one truth and our enemies are one falsehood? Bala, of course he is. Verbatim, the words of Abu Bakr, like the the words of the Messenger, shows you the reality of the spirit of Abu Bakr. <coughs> so why then do we attribute abasement to our religion, Umar says. Abu Bakr says, oh my dear fellow, verily he is the Messenger of God. He does not disobey his Lord, and God is his victor. <laughs> so then Umar then says, I mean Abu Bakr says, so hold tight to his reins, hold on to him tightly, for by God he is upon truth, verily he is upon truth. Huh? So what does Umar say? Did he not used to tell us that we would come into the house and say, come on, related? Abu Bakr said, yeah, he did say that. But did he say this? Yeah. <laughs> Abu Bakr said, Abu Bakr says, no. And then Abu Bakr says, then he will visit the house and say, come on, related. And that you're going to see the darajah of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Didn't hear the words of prophecy, but does he need to be present to hear the words of prophecy? Um Hani, the the, the, uh, the sister of Ali bin Abi Talib, she used to say that we used to, from the, the confines, I used to be on my arish, on my bed, and I could hear the Prophet Sallallahu reciting the Quran from the depths of his house. And from a distance that she could hear it, she had that radio nabuwa, the, the, the voice of prophecy coming that live and direct to her house. That's hearts that connect with the great heart. And that's part of our assumptions of Abu Bakr. Don't think it's just intuition of Abu Bakr. He's tuned into the reality of prophecy, the words of prophecy, even though he's absent. Radhi Allah Ta'ala, Anhu wa Arda. Okay? This event should clarify to you the incumbency of obeying him and submitting to his affair, even if it seems to contradict the dictates of logic or his dislike. Ibn Bahraq says it is incumbent that the legal responsible individual that he believes that all good lies in what the Prophet Sallallahu has commanded and that it is the essence of piety that procures felicity in the world and the hereafter and that it has come in the most complete and perfect of ways except the vast majority of intellects fall short of apprehending its objective and its final outcome. Like we try and see things in the now. You see, the Prophet Sallallahu who are the greatest manifestation of the original primordial worldview of the Arabs. The worldview of the Arabs is that they see the future in the present. And the Prophet Sallallahu in that moment could see how the entire thing played out. And many of the Sahaba, they fell short. And it wasn't aligned with the divine. They say the gaze of God, the gaze of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is in the eternal now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees it in the eternal now, the eternal moment. There's no past, present or future for the divine Jalla fil It's all in the midst of the eternal now. And as the entire thing plays out, yani within a year, they besieged Khaybar sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're going to bring down the final fortress of the Jews and now place absolute peace with the Jewish nation. But now they got it with the Arabs. And then a year after that, or in the same year, they're going to now conquer Mecca. And you see, within two years, how the whole thing plays out. Conquer Mecca without war. There was an army of 10,000. Mecca falls virtually peacefully with virtually no blood being shed. Okay? And now in the midst of that, now the Prophet ﷺ can speak the greater word to the world. And now he begins to address the Persians, address the Romans, address the Abyssinians, address the Egyptians, address Muluk al-Arab. Because to address all the kings of the Arabs, the Arab, the Bahrainis, the Yemenis, can be addressed up one by one with the, what the voice of prophecy, with the word of prophecy, the divine summons. Okay? That's where we're at. And inshallah ta'ala, in our next session, inshallah, we begin to sort of look at the world address. And then thereafter, we begin to look at Fatih Mecca, Fatih Mecca. Anyone have any questions, inshallah ta'ala? Any questions? Sheikh, I missed Purba's poor name. Purba means. Urwa. Ibn Mas'ud, 
al-Thaqafi, Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi. He's later going to be called Muslim. Look at Sayyidina Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi. He's going to later, after, you know, from the results of Hudaybiyah, Urwa becomes Muslim. Because in that period of peace, what, does, what happens in the period of peace? Now there's no war by contract. That now you can begin to exchange. So the disbelievers will go to the actual Medina. Because it's on the caravan routes. And they'll be like, like, what is it that, that the man's really saying? And they'll listen to the Prophet So it's in that period you're going to see great people become Muslim. You're going to see whom Khalid ibn Walid become Muslim. You're going to see Amr ibn Aras become Muslim. You're going to see Urwa ibn Mas'ud al Faqafi become Muslim. Who's Muslim? And look at the greatness of Urwa, and subhanAllah, transformation in a moment. He becomes Muslim in front of the Prophet and then he asks the Prophet I want permission to go to Faqif. Can I leave Medina just to go and call my people? I want to go convey the entire Taif. The Prophet says it's better for you to remain in Medina. He insists, I want to convey Taif. Prophet then gives him permission, Allah He leaves Medina, goes to Taif. As he arrives at Taif, which is a fortress city, Rabbi Mas'ud al Faqafi, and it's like he can't wait to tell his people, yani, I'm Muslim, I'm Muslim, I believe in Muhammad. Yani, he utters those words, assassinated on the spot. On the spot, outside of the city of Ta'if. The ruler of Ta'if, because of those words. And the said, What did he do for the sake of Islam? How many prayers did he pray? How much charity did he give? How many days did he fast? As if nothing, as if he had no what we'd call amal or salihah other than the shah, other than the shahada, and then Allah Ta'ala granted him shahada. And somebody of high tarajat in paradise, the great Urwa ibn Mas'ud al Faqafi, the one who has a back beard, a striking resemblance to Jesus. So these are going to be part of the great victory that Allah Ta'ala in the Mubina. We give you a clear victory. We see many of the people couldn't see it, but the Prophet Sallallahu saw it very, very clearly. Who is going to become Muslim at that period of time? What was going to happen? That's going to be minimal bloodshed. Khaybah, minimal bloodshed. When that's the siege. At Mecca, minimal bloodshed. So you see the manifestation of peace upon him in Arabia. Any questions? I should, you said that he, he, uh, the fact that this man had been murdered was, was this information that reached the companions. Yeah. At what stage was this proof that it was, you know, this information? Uh, before the coming of Budaya. Before the coming of Budeir, who is going to be the first negotiate, the first one to, and you know, he's trying to find out reconnaissance, like what is it that, that these people want, he have already sent message back that Uthman is what is, is alive and well. Alive and well. Yeah. Any questions, inshallah ta'ala? This uh, retreat for Bekul Rawat Rewan was uh, famously cut down by uh, Umar ibn Khattab, uh, 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 obviously to stop Rida at that time. Uh, at that period of uh, of Umar Islam was its greatest uh, period, and I can't understand how there would be any bidah at that time. So any which you know, uh, uh, Umar cut the tree down for the uh, the tree that was mentioned. Yeah, well. yeah. At, at, obviously during this time, and uh, because it caused bidah, you know, stop, to stop the uh, what, uh, what I'm trying to say is at that period you don't expect any bidah to be happening because of the Sahaba was the greatest. Then he hit on the presupposition pre that it was an issue of bid'ah. And how is it going to be understood? Because in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, you see the expansion of Islam, vast expansion of Islam. So it's not an issue of the Sahaba. It's an issue of people who are now coming into the religion, in Tabi'in. People who are now coming into the religion who are brand new to the religion of Islam. And in that, there's no doubt, they're brand new that they're going to bring yani, yani ancient beliefs with it. And that it would be what the justification of Umar ibn al-Khattab to do that. Not, it's not to do with the Sahaba whatsoever, not to do with the Sahaba. But to say that there's not problematic practices in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, of course there is. No doubt, because of the vast, the vast and quick expansion of Islam. I mean, it was the greatest manifestation of the problems in that era. Yeah, the bonfire of Uthman, that Uthman gathers every single Mus'haf from the world, from the various regions of Islam, and tortures them in Medina to Munawara. I that the, the people becoming Muslim were beginning to write the Quran in their own dialects, with their own mistakes, they were changing the actual Mus'haf. That's why Amr Uthman like, bans all of the Masahif. I mean, that sort of great and whatever happened at the Acacia. Yani. So these problems were about new people just becoming Muslim, and they weren't yet familiar with the actual, what the, the, the true sort of faith, belief, monotheism of Islam. That was the issue.